Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. If you were here on Sunday, I exhorted the congregation that there's some things coming forth on Wednesday night that a lot of people in our church need to hear right now. And um, I know it may sound like a man said that, but guys, I'm very cautious to do my best not to say anything like that and to mess up the leading of the Spirit in your life by something that's not the leading of the Spirit. I really believe the Lord prompted me to say that, that there's some things coming forth in this series we're in right now on Wednesday night that a lot of people in this church need to hear. I don't know if it's for something coming up around the corner or something you're going through presently or overcoming something of your past, but there's some things we're talking about in this series that there's some people in our church must hear. It's a must. And I don't say that all the time, and I'm very cautious to say that unless I have the unction of the Lord to say that. But it's very important. This is a very, very timely and important series that the Lord has given me to share with you. And so I'm glad you're here tonight, and I'm glad you're watching online. So let's just pray before we go any further that we get everything we need to get tonight. Father, thank you for your word. We're asking, Lord, that your word would come forth boldly tonight as it ought to that you'd help us to be good hearers tonight, help us to receive and absorb everything the Spirit of God brings forth, whether we hear it audibly or if you just talk to us between the lines in our own heart, we're asking, Lord, help us to get everything tonight that we need to get. You know our future. You know our present. You know everything about us. We believe you're going to equip us tonight, and you're going to help us to live in victory. You're going to help us to get the victory. You're going to help us to stay in victory. And you're going to help us to see things we need to see, hear things we need to hear, know things we need to know, and do things that we need to do. Thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you guys have that little JPEG back there for the series title? If you could put that up on the screen. We're in, a, we're in the series right now. We, we changed the name of the series about, well, I think, last week from Messing Up the Devil's Plans, which is really good, to, more specifically, The Devil is Beautiful. And I know some people think, Pastor, what are you saying? That's blasphemy. No, the Bible says he's beautiful. And I'll show you the scripture. He's, he's mean at heart, but he appears beautiful to a lot of people. And the reason he does is so they won't resist him. Who's going to resist beautiful? Who's going to resist angel of light? Who's going to resist pleasure? You know, well, we, we need to know. Just because an atmosphere is bright pointing you to go a certain way or saying you can do... Just because the atmosphere is bright, listen closely, that is not the number one thing we judge whether we should go that way or not. God is light, but sometimes the devil comes with artificial light. Light cannot be light, pleasure, brightness, smarts, cannot be the final say about which direction we go in life because the devil operates in a lot of those areas. And you have to have more word in you to know that a good feeling is not the right way to go when that good feeling is not in line with the word. See, I don't know what people are waiting for. I think they're waiting for a monster or a boogeyman or some really ugly creature to appear to them before they go, Oh no, that's the devil. I resist you. Friend, the devil comes to you in more ways than just fear. That's just one of many ways he tries to trip up people. Fear is only one way the devil comes against people. There's many times the devil comes disguised in the light of your own desires. Many times the devil will come to you with a bright atmosphere trying to convince you that this way is the best way when God already told you something else. And the sad thing about it is marriages and relationships and ministries have been ruined and destroyed because people went more with that atmosphere that seemed right and felt right than what they knew God told them in their past from the scriptures and by the Spirit of God. Many things have been destroyed. Many lives, many ministries have been destroyed because people went with an inward feeling more than the Word of God. The devil is tricky in this area. Don't think he is. He is crafty. He's been doing this for 6,000 years. He is super good at it. He knows what makes you tick. He is familiar with your life and your parents' life and your grandparents and your great-grandparents. He knows the things going on in your family. He will work anything he can. And here's the thing you need to realize. He will attack you in such a way you do not know he's attacking you. 
if you knew it was demonic, you wouldn't yield to it. He's got to make the demonic look godly. He's got to make bright look right. <laughs> Amen? And most people just think bright is right. Well, let's read this scripture and you'll see that that's not true. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. The Lord's given us some revelation. I don't know if there's some things that are going to escalate. I don't know if there's some people trapped right now. But this is a, a message for right now. Look at 2 Corinthians 11. And we're going to just go ahead and go right to verse 14. Paul's talking about false apostles and people that were doing deceitful works and, you know, all this stuff. And he says in verse 14, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So everything that's bright is not right. Everything you feel that's bright is not right. Everything that the atmosphere is projecting that's bright doesn't mean it's right. The devil knows no one is going to go down a wrong road that feels like a wrong road. So how are you and I going to know? Well, how are we going to know then what's the right road? Right here. Know this word enough to know that when something bright feels right, seems good, seems okay, comes your way, you know immediately if it's God or not, not by a feeling, not by a brightness, but by the word of God, and you'll know. See, who, who's going to resist light? Who's going to resist, uh, you know, beauty? Who's going to resist? Well, we should be. <laughs> right? Here's the thing. The Bible says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. What are you waiting for? An ugly creature? Somebody that says, I'm going to kill you? What about those little subtle, tricky, crafty maneuvers of the enemy trying to ever so slow you get you off the perfect path of God for your life so five years later your whole life is messed up, your destiny's blown? See, the enemy knows if he comes in too fast or if he comes in, you know, too bold with the demonic, nobody is going to open the door to that. Nobody's going to... He has to find ways to convince you a wrong road is not that bad. He'll do it with feelings. He'll do it with suggestions. He'll try to create an atmosphere around you that all is well and all is not well a lot of times just because it seems well. I've seen people mess up. I've seen people, they, they thought the Lord was... See, the enemy, he, talking about transforming himself into an angel of light. He's trying to appear that this is good. This is right. This is godly. What should you be on guard for? Sly, crafty, tricky feelings, atmospheres, suggestions, poles that feel wonderful. And if you're not scripturally smart and you don't really, really, really love the Lord, don't think you can't be sucked into something that others have been sucked into. I'm going to show you from the scripture tonight, very, very spiritual people were sucked into it. And left ministry, left rewards in the next life, left amazing positions because something so crafty got these men of God off into things that felt amazing, looked fascinating, seemed all right. And if they can be tricked, we can be tricked. But we won't be tricked if we do the simple things the Lord told us to do to be aware of these lies and to stay above them. And one of them is what you're doing right now. Getting yourself to a church service in the middle of the week and staying steady and staying grounded in the Word of God and staying built up and staying refreshed so when these sly, tricky attacks come that seem bright and like God, you'll know that's not God, that's not God, that's an angel of light. That's something the enemy's trying to do to get me out of my place, to get me off into a wrong road, to get me into something I shouldn't be into. And here's something else you have to watch out about. If you don't want to be, see, be deceived in these days, you have to watch out about everybody's doing it must be okay. Guys, Jesus said, broad is the way to destruction. Many go that way. Straight and narrow is the way to life, and few there be that find it. 
Are you listening to me? Somebody says, I don't know. You Christians seem so narrow-minded and, and just so narrow and saved. <laughs> call me narrow, call me straight, call me old-fashioned, but I'm also saved. Broad is the way to destruction. Many are going that route. Majority is not always right. A lot of times, most of the time, they're not right. It's just people following people instead of looking to the Lord for themselves. Actually, I know I heard Keith Moore say this recently. He said, you know, when it comes to word of faith believers, when it comes to people like us who believe what we believe, you know, f victory for everybody, healing for all, being filled with the Spirit, speaking in tongues, available to every believer, a very, very small percent of the people on this planet believe that, believe like we believe. That's why I don't care about statistics. Well, statistics say everybody's going to get the flu. Well, statistics say that, you know, everybody's going to do this. And, uh uh. Statistics are mostly taken, and polls are mostly taken just, you know, from people who don't speak in tongues, don't believe in divine healing, don't have faith. So don't let st statistics bother you. Yeah, well, statistics say this. Well, it's totally different when you believe God, fill with the Spirit, speak in tongues, believe healings for all, go to the right church. It's a whole, whole different deal. So, so look at this verse again. Put it up on the screen, verse 14. Paul says, don't marvel at these people who seem to be right that are not right. And then he breaks it down and says, Satan's even like that. Himself is transformed into an angel of light. So I ask myself this question. Why transform? Why not just be the devil? Why, why transform into an angel of light? Now, he's still the devil, but he's transforming his appearance as an angel of life. Why do that? To deceive people. He knows we won't fall for the obvious demonic. He, know we, he knows we won't fall for the grotesque. And I'm going to show you in the next scripture, we've been going to this. I, I, I've always wanted to teach on the scriptures that we're going to tonight, but I really haven't had freedom to like do it in a series over and over and over again. You wonder, well, Pastor, you go to the same scriptures every week. Yeah, because we can't let them slip. And it's got to get rooted in our life, not just, you know, circulating in our brain. And so I thought, why does he do this? To deceive people. Well, I, the devil, he's just a dumb devil. I, 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 I can overcome the devil. I'm going to say it again. You and I are absolutely zero match intellectually against the devil. He will tie you up with his smarts and wisdom, and even though it's corrupted, and spit you out. We are zero intellectual match for him. One main reason, he's been around a lot longer than you. <laughs> I mean, we see him in the Garden of Eden 6,000 years ago as a fallen being. He had, an, he had a lot of time before that when he wasn't a fallen being, when he was uh, worshiping God and doing his part in heaven or on the earth before, before he fell. So don't try to intellectually have it out with the devil. He will whip you and <laughs> he will twist you in circles. He... He's been around a lot longer. Don't even try to intellectually war against the devil. Here's what you need to do. Look to the one who's been around longer than him. Come on, who's been around longer than the devil? The devil's been around that millennia. Who's been around long? Well, God has. <laughs> He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, right? Lucifer is a created being. God created him, a very good angel. And the devil, in his own heart, without any temptation, decided to rebel and sin and try to exalt his throne above the stars of God. And God said, nope. You'll be brought down to hell in the sides of the pit, and they that see you shall narrowly look upon you and say, is this the man that made the earth to quake and shook kingdoms? So, I want to show you what Ezekiel saw by the Holy Spirit. We've been going to the scriptures. So go to Ezekiel 28. You know, Hollywood, some artists, some people that smoke too much pot, <laughs> they, they try to draw what they think the devil looks like. 
Are you listening to me? And, and they come up with all these grotesque fangs and, and just, you know, horns and just, just slobber and muscles and unscriptural. Actually, those things that you see that portray the devil as some equal opposite of God that maybe has a chance or some strong being, those paintings and those images are usually inspired by the devil. <laughs> some of these movies in Hollywood that portray the devil as a, you know, grotesque and they're, most of them are inspired by the devil to get people afraid or to put him in the myth zone so you never resist him. Who's going to resist a myth, Right? Uh, but the Bible has a lot to say about this. So in Ezekiel 28, and remember, he, he's transformed into an angel of light so he can deceive people into thinking something is good that's not good. So you there in Ezekiel? Let's look at chapter 20. And now this, what we're going to read here, Ezekiel got a glimpse of eternity past. God showed him through a word of knowledge. The origin of Lucifer, the fall of Lucifer, and some things he was involved in before he fell. And it also shows a word of wisdom concerning his end. So in Ezekiel chapter 28, in verse 11, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus says the Lord God, you seal up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You have been in Eden, the garden of God. So you'll see right here, he's not talking about a man when he mentions the king of Tyrus. He's talking about an evil spirit behind the scenes influencing the prince of Tyrus, which he talks about in verse 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This was a wicked principality and power. This was the devil himself behind the prince of Tyrus, as you see the first few verses talk about. But now he's talking about a spiritual ruler over the natural man who was yielding to the devil at this time. Because, I mean, no physical man was in the Garden of Eden at the time of this writing. This was a lot farther after Adam and Eve. I mean, no man could live that long. Talking about a spiritual being. And you'll see more. He mentions anointed cherub, which is a class of angel referring to Lucifer. So he says, Take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus says the Lord God, you seal up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in what? Beauty. beauty. Everybody say wisdom, wisdom. And, beauty. and beauty. This is what you have to be on guard for. When it comes to the enemy trying to trip you up, get you out of your place, mess with your life, and destroy you. You don't, just, you don't just need to be on guard for fear only. Yes, if fear comes, resist it in Jesus' name and it'll leave you. But this scripture says, wait a second, we're, we're called to resist the devil and he will flee from us. Well, what is he? Who is he? What is he like? He's beautiful. He's smart. Now, he's not smart anymore in a good sense, but he's very smart when it comes to tricking and deceiving. Everybody say wisdom and beauty. What should you be on guard for? Corrupted wisdom, right? And beauty with an evil motive. Hmm? I think it's interesting, you know, even in the book of Proverbs, you know, Solomon talks about the harlot and, and he's encouraging all men and, and people everywhere saying, lust not after her beauty. Don't let her take you with her eyelids. See, everything that's evil isn't ugly. But we're way beyond just, just physical here. So it says, he's full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Look at verse 13. He said, you have been in Eden, the garden of God, every precious stone you're covering. Did you see the word was in the King James? It's italicized. It's not in the original. 
Every precious stone, your covering, the sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of your tabrets and of your pipes was prepared in you in the day you were created. So stop right there. We saw also and touched on this a little bit that you have to be cautious about what you open your soul and spirit up to in this music area. The enemy does have a foothold in music in the earth. He's very, very gifted and talented. He lost his place, but he did not lose all his abilities. Are you following? He lost his place, but he's still him. I know I, I've, there's certain songs that will mess with your insides in a not good way. The enemy knows. He knows people will open up to certain beats and, and certain, and I'm not crazy, I'm not going to say every uh, rock and roll beat. And I'm, I like rock and roll and, you know, it can be good Christian coming from a Christian heart. The Lord told me a long time ago, death and life is in the power of the tongue, not in the power of the guitar or the drums. Right. It's the heart behind the scene. I know God likes a good rock song once in a while because he helped me write some. <laughs> um, but you have to watch out. I mean, there's, there's a couple songs. I can name titles of some songs right now that I could speak to you that you would go, oh my gosh, those are some of the best songs ever written on this planet. And they are. But they're not at all godly. They have a, 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 a negative connotation to them. And they will mess with your emotions. Get you beholding strange people. I mean weird stuff. I mean you, you and I also know there's some things. Some people have done crazy things. After listening to certain songs over and over and over again. <clears throat> but. Got to watch out for that too. Um, so next verse 14 says. You are the anointed cherub that covers so at, he was a cher he's a cherub angel cherubim and in his previous life before he fell he was over something he covered something and he God said I set you that way you were upon the holy mountain of God you have walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire this is him before he fell you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you now it talks about his fall look at this by the multitude of your merchandise they have filled the midst of you with violence and you have sinned Therefore, I will cast you as profane out of the mountain of God. I'll destroy you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. Oh, the enemy works on people in this area. He tries to get people thinking they're so beautiful that if they don't go out there in the world and live the high life, they're missing out on something. You know, you're too good for these people. Are you too this for that? Are you be happier over here? He did it and he tries to get other people to do it. Your heart was lifted up because of what? Because of his ugliness? No, because of his beauty. You have corrupted your wisdom. So he still got the wisdom, but it's corrupted. And the reason, the reason you corrupted your wisdom was by reason of your brightness. We're talking about a very, very beautiful, bright, smart angel. I will cast you to the ground. I will lay you before kings that they may behold you. You have defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your perversions, by the iniquity of your traffic. Therefore, I'll bring forth a fire from the midst of you. It'll devour you and I'll bring you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold you. And all that know you among the people shall be astonished at you. You shall be a terror and never shall you be anymore. I never get tired of reading this passage of scriptures. Full of revelation. God says, let me show you guys through the prophet Ezekiel about the past concerning Lucifer and some about his future when he's destroyed forever. You know, lake of fire. This is so amazing. I didn't see one thing in there that said the devil was ugly. Actually, I saw the opposite. 
And he uses these things that God made him like to deceive people. And I, I made this statement, a couple, I think it was last week, and I mentioned it the week before, that there are some believers that they're, they're not resisting anything of the devil. And if that's the case, that shows us he's getting away with some stuff in their lives that they don't even know he's getting away with. Little foxes, things behind the scenes, things that aren't obvious. And here's the good news, guys. When you know the truth about these things, you're going uh, to you're going to identify these things. You're going to go, "Wait a second. I've been listening to the wrong thing. This is not in line with scripture. It felt right. It seemed bright, but it wasn't the will of God." And you find out from the word of God, you take the word, you ad you address that thing and say, "Uh-uh, no more." And the enemy he is constantly trying to get people to follow their feelings. Now, this is Wednesday, so it's midweek meet. So we get into a little th few things that are a little bit deeper. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a couple more things here, and then we're going to go into this last thing I have for you tonight that I believe will really help you. Um, in James 4, go ahead and turn to verse 7. James chapter 4, verse 7. One of the, the main reasons we're talking about this is so we know what to resist. I think we got it down. Yes, resist a monster if it comes after you, okay? <laughs> yes, resist the boogeyman if he comes after you. But don't just be looking for those two things. The enemy wants to deceive and trip you up with seemingly good and okay things, anything but the will of God for your life. So look here in James 4, 7. The Bible says, submit yourselves. So God's not going to make you do this. Only you can do it. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. And if you've done that, resist the devil and he will flee from you. It's hard to resist the devil and he flee from you if you're living in known disobedience. But he said, if you're submitted to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, I want you to understand this. Submitting to God doesn't mean you're perfect and doesn't mean you're never going to you're never you're never going to make any more mistakes. But it does mean if you do make a mistake, you fess up to it, confess your sins, and God will be he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So don't don't think he's talking about being technically perfect when he says submit yourselves to God. He's just talking about walking in the light you have, growing if you fall, ask God to forgive you, get up and go on. And you're still submitted to God. But now resist the devil and he will flee from you. So a huge part of living in victory is knowing what to resist. A huge part to living in victory is knowing what to resist. Did you know there's a lot of things people are praying for God to take away that he ain't going to take away? He already told you to resist it and it would flee from you. I'm going to say it again. There's two prayers that God can't answer. It's not, not necessarily the only two, but there's two prayers that God can't answer. Number one, God cannot answer a prayer when you ask him to do something he's already done. You just need to read the book, find out he's done it, and say thank you for it and believe it's yours. Another prayer God can't answer is when you're asking him to do something he told you to do. How does that work? How could you ask God to do something he's already told you to do? How could he answer that prayer? If he already told you to do it. This is one of the things he's told us to do. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Got that? So with that in mind, now go to 2 Timothy. I'm, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 4. There's two things that jumped out as I was praying and studying, getting ready for this, this Wednesday night service. There's two things that jumped out to me that are major, major maneuvers of the devil right now against the church, against Christians. Anybody want to know what I, what I, what I heard this afternoon? Yeah. Big deal here. Big, big deal. Two things we need to be aware of and totally on guard for, especially in the days we're living in. We're going to talk about the first one in the last few minutes. The next one we will talk about next week as the Lord leads. But two things. I'm going to tell you what they both are, and then we're going to focus for a few minutes on the first one. Two things you and I need to be on extra guard for 
One of them is, and these are all designed to get us out of God's best, get us out of the plan of God, make us ineffective in the body of Christ. Number one, we need to be on guard for anything that is trying to attract us more into the world, the world system. Worldly attractions. Temptations to veer into worldliness is great. It, it, I don't know, maybe more, more than all time. I, I don't think so. I think a lot of these things do go in, in circles, but man, does it seem strong right now. I am seeing Christians fall left and right for stuff that's bright, feels all right, it's fun, and it's totally not God. I think the same, the, the devil's saying the same thing to the t today's church worldwide as he said to Eve. You're missing out on something. You're missing out on something. God's holding out on you. You're missing out on something. You go God's way, you'll never experience anything like this. You better get it now because life is short. <laughs> then he'll mix some of that in with a midlife crisis, which I don't believe in, and really mess people up. So in 1 Timothy chapter 4, go ahead and read verse 1. The Spirit of God speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. It should be the word demons instead of devils because in reality... Um, you know, the King James translation translated it devils for some reason, but really it's a different word. It really should be translated demons. He here's the thing. One devil, many demons. But you, it, we still know what he's talking about. So this is interesting here because he's talking about believers in the days we're living in, listening to seducing spirits and doctrines that are actually being promoted by the devil to get people out of faith. And again, these spirits have been around a long, long time. And the only way you will even recognize that you're being tempted by a seducing spirit is if you love God a lot and you have a lot of scriptures in you. You're no match any other way. I'm telling you, you're no match just because you're smart, just because you're strong, just because you've got muscle, just because you're a good businessman. You're no match for these spirits without having an on-fire daily walk with God and knowing a lot of scriptures. I know that's maybe not the best news, but it's, it's good news. <laughs> it's really good news. I know some people don't want to hear this because there's more responsibility in their court, but let me read you 1 Timothy 4.1 out of the New Living Translation. Um, I don't know if they have the NLT back there. If not, I've got it here. So just listen to this out of the New Living Translation. It's a more modern translation to help you understand it a little bit more. They do have it. Look up there on the screen. Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, some will turn away from the true faith. Ah. Ah. The true faith, they will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. Everybody say true faith. Do you realize there's a false faith that looks a lot like real faith? Do you guys realize? The Bible talks about Timothy having the same unfeigned faith that his mommy had and that his grandmother had. Unfeigned means not false. There must be a false faith. I call it knockoff faith. I actually, <laughs> I actually got a watch one time. Um, Katy Perry's dad, we were having dinner and and uh, he gave me a watch, and it's a, it's a Rolex watch, I think. <laughs> he had gotten in an offering, and he just gave it to me for some reason as we were having dinner. And, um, and Keith said, Keith Hudson, he said, Here, here's this watch if you want. I said, is it a real Rolex? He goes, I don't know. I don't know. 
And so I got this watch. I mean, it says Swiss made on the band. It, the, you know, the second hand is real smooth. It's heavy. It lasts. It, you don't need to wind it up. It just goes by movement. Everything. And I, I, I can't tell. And I don't even know some of the jewelers I took it to. They weren't 100% sure either, I don't think. I mean, one, one said, no, that's not, a Ro that's not a Rolex. But I just think they maybe they wanted to sell me one or something. I don't know. I could be wrong. I might be judging. I shouldn't do that. But it's very difficult to tell if it's a real Rolex. I just like wearing it because it lasts forever and doesn't need batteries. It's solid and it's a great watch. So I, I like it. But, um, it, you know, they, call, they don't call them knockoffs anymore. They call them designer-inspired. <laughs> <laughs> it's a knockoff, but they call them designer inspired. Well, I, you know, there's there's a there's a demonically inspired. But you know something? I'm going to say this. This is really interesting. Satan knows how God operates, and he copies God's style for evil. Got to remember, Lucifer knows God. He's been around him a lot. And he knows what works. And so he, he it's kind of like designer inspired. You know, it's like, it's not God, but it's like God, but it's not God. Right. Are you following me here? And so he knows how God operates and he copies his style for evil. So we just have to be on guard, man. We just, we got, and here's the cool thing about it. It's really not that hard to be aware of the enemy's tactics and resist him. You just got to do a few simple things. And Christianity has got to be a lifestyle, not just a once a week deal. And you'll be fine. Um, let me tell you um, the word um, seducing. I looked it up in the original and I looked it up in... Uh, in the Greek, and I looked it up in the dictionary, and um, it means to lead astray, usually by persuasion or false promises. The word seduction means, you know, seducing spirits. It means attract. I would say attract. See, that's different than attack, but it is an attack. But the devil knows he's got to attract you and not think he that you're that he's attacking you he's got to win you over kind of like Adam and Eve you know I mean the devil comes to Eve in the garden right in Genesis chapter 3 and they just start talking you know hey how's it going Eve you know you, you can eat them you can eat more trees than, than this I mean it's okay <laughs> it's like first mistake having a conversation with the devil <laughs> first mistake so just say, shut up and get out. So to lead astray, usually by persuasion or false promises, seduction means attract to a belief or into a course of action that is inadvisable or foolhardy. And that's what these seducing spirits try to do. So turn now to 2 Timothy chapter 4, because i got to close here. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now, do you all realize that we're talking about a... A, a foe who is eternally defeated by Jesus. The only thing he can do is try to deceive you to get you to use your God-given powers against yourself. You know, get your faith into fear. Get your confession going the wrong way so you open up to things that you don't want in your life. So, I want you to know 2 Timothy chapter 4. I, I know... We're at the end here, but please don't, don't, don't miss this. This is really, really important. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and I want you to notice here. Uh, let's see. Let's look at verse 6. Paul said, I'm now ready to be offered. In other words, he's ready to go to heaven. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Stop right there. Paul made it to the finish line. He, he came up against temptations just like we do. He came up against oppositions and persecutions just like we do. He came up against spirits trying to steal his faith, trying to get him to leave God, trying to get him to throw up his hands and say, this is not worth it. I've been beaten with rods. I've been a shipwrecked. I've been a night and a day in the deep. I've been among false brethren. I've been in perils in the water, perils among my own countrymen. I've been in perils in this. He went through all kinds of devils trying to get him to quit. But Paul had a revelation and we need to have it too. You know what it is? You know what it is? 
just a few more days and we're going to be in eternity. We don't want to trade the entertainment of this world. We don't want to trade a little pleasure here and there for eternal rewards. We need to make it to the end. This life is like a vapor. We need to stay committed, fooey on all these things trying to pull us and say, well, you're missing out on this, you're missing out on that. We ain't missing out on nothing if we're following God with all our heart. The devil will offer you all kinds of stuff in this vapor. You know, your life on earth is like a vapor. It appears for a little time and vanishes away. So, Paul said in verse 8, Therefore, because I fought a good fight, I finished my course, I've kept the faith. He said, Therefore, there is laid up for me a crown, rewards of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. So let me just say this. There are rewards for those who don't veer off under pressure. And there will be pressure. And I'm not just talking about fear. I'm talking about things you really want. Things you really desire. Things you feel like if you don't get them, they'll never come around again. There will be pressure from A to Z to try to get you to, one, number one, not go to heaven, but number two, to not get anything when you get there. No rewards. Paul said, there's a crown laid up for me. Why? He fought a good fight. He finished his course. He kept the faith. Why say fight if there's no opposition to you going on with God? And the fight is not what a lot of people think it is. It's fighting against things that you really want that the enemy says he will give you. He did it to Jesus. He'll do it to you. The devil, I wrote a song, the devil offered me a kingdom full of riches and fame. So, just remember, life on earth is very, very short compared to eternity. We don't want to give up eternal rewards for a little pleasure and comfort here in this vapor. Now, look at the next verse. Next verse. Do your diligence, Timothy, to come shortly unto me. Now notice, keep going. For Demas, one of Paul's staff members, worked with Paul in the ministry, the Apostle Paul. Now Demas has forsaken me, Paul said. Who in the world would forsake Paul? <laughs> Who would want to leave this? He's making history that's going to be talked about for eternity made the Bible. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and he is departed unto Thessalonica. If Demas could be deceived, Paul's right-hand person, helper in the ministry, if Demas, Paul saw Jesus multiple times. Paul had visions of the Lord. Paul operated in miracles and power that not just everybody operates in. Demas is right there in the middle of this revival and this life power, uh, the writing of the New Testament. If he could be pulled, we could be pulled. What do you think? Think we should stay really close to God? And maybe not so close to the world? Yeah, but all the other Christians are doing it. Yeah, but we're not following other Christians. We're following the Lord. Right. Now, if some other Christians are following the Lord, leaders in the Lord, we follow them as they follow the Lord. Right. But friend, no, notice this. Now, Thessalonica at this time it was known as a city of entertainment, circuses, gladiators, events that the public just loved. He got his eyes on Vegas. And don't get me wrong, Vegas, I believe, is coming to the Lord because we got some friends that pastor a church in Summerlin, Nevada, right north of Las Vegas. But think about this. Demas got too close to the world and it sucked him in. The tractor beam kicked in. And he decided to go into something. He, real, he, he got the thinking, wasn't really that bad. 
Come on, Paul. Others are, you know, they're okay with this practice and they're okay with this thing and they're okay with that. This is sad because this is like um, departing from the faith. So Demas was on Paul's team. Now, you, you, you need to be glad I, I'm done tonight. <laughs> That's what I have here. I wasn't sure I was going to share. So I don't have any time to share it right now, but maybe some other time. But um, if this could happen to a man like this, it could happen to anybody. And you've got to watch out about getting too close to the world. 1 John 2.15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the, of the Father, but of the world. I, I'm, I'm a little concerned. I, I, I accept after a teaching like tonight, I pray this word gets out there. I've been a little concerned about the pull and the sly and the seductive, uh, behind the scenes, almost hardly noticeable warfare that's happening against a lot of Christians. It's, it's, there's a worldly attraction that's pulling people into it worldly practices, worldly entertainment. And though some of it is okay, what it leads to is terrible. Now, Carla and I, we like a good movie now and then. We'll watch a good, clean movie now and then. We've, we decided a long time ago we don't, we don't like to watch R-rated movies. We just, we're just like that because there's, just, there's a certain atmosphere that puts you in. Even if it's something, you know, Anyway, we, there's just certain things we don't like to let in our house. I mean, what's a few more years? Who, I can do without a few movies for a few more years compared to eternity. If it's going to mess up my... Here's something you have to watch out for. The devil will, will lead you to be involved with things that are okay, but he knows they'll keep you from God's best. So if he can't just come in and knock you off your feet, he'll at least try to keep you from God's best with something that appeals to you. You have to watch out about this. So, so think about this. Demas forsook Paul having loved this present world. Listen closely. Listen, you ready for this? The Bible says Satan is the God of this world. Get too close to the world. Who else are you getting too close to? The God of this world. Jesus said the prince of this world comes but he has nothing in me. The Bible says the whole world lies in wickedness under the power of the evil one. That's why you don't want to get too close to the world. Amen? Now, we're, gonna go, we're, we're in the world, so let's get sinners saved. Right? Let's get people to church. Let's get people growing in God. Some people think, well, we've got to go to all the world and preach the gospel, so I'm going to go to those bars and start drinking beer with them so I can be a witness to them. <laughs> you're going to be a witness to them if you're a backslidden Christian, you have very little character, and you're more like them than you are like Jesus. They don't need you being like them. They need you strong to save them. <laughs> right? um, there's, um, so... The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, it says that in the last days, people will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. I thought it was interesting. He didn't say there'd be people in the last days who'd be lovers of pleasures instead of lovers of God. These are Christians he's talking about. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. They love God a little bit. They love pleasure a lot more. These are believers slipping in the last days and going for pleasure more than the will of God. Carla t taught a while back in the church on um, come out among them and be you separate, says the Lord, and I'll be a father and you'll be my children. Talking about coming out from the world and all these unbelievers. Come out from among them, be you separate, and I'll be your father and you'll be my children. And you taught about the seeker-friendly church movement that started up a few, couple decades ago in, in the country and where, where they went out and did a poll and asked everybody and all the, went door to door and said, okay, we're from a church over here. We just want to know, what could we change so you'll come to our church and be comfortable? And they started listening to unbelievers. Change church to, to, to satisfy unbelievers. 
Well, these same people saw what was happening. I mean, all kinds of stuff started happening. I mean, drinking went crazy in the church. Still is in a lot of circles. Just absolutely crazy. Yeah. Um, just, just, living huh? Living together. living together, not being married. It's okay, you know. And, and just all this worldliness came into the church so that the church would be more comfortable in church. Sinners who are on their way to hell don't need to feel okay when they come to church. They need to sense love, but they also need to sense, I need a change here. Yeah, that's right. yep. And you can have both in the same atmosphere, love and conviction. Yep. And then these same people, after what, 10, 15 years of user-friendly church skyrocketing, churches exploding because now sinners are, you know, are so welcome and not challenged and... and those same people said, we never should have done it. It messed the church up. The founders of user-friendly churches realized they messed up. Now I just wish all the hundreds of millions they affected would realize that. Yeah. Hmm. All these things. Now, I, I, I have a sermon I'm going to teach sometime as the Lord leaves, as the Lord leads. <laughs> um... <laughs> Um, but I'm not going to even give you the title of it right now, so why do I, why do I even say that? <laughs> I will say this. I will say this. I, I will go ahead and tell you, and I, I, I you know, it may not be now, but it, it concerns me. I, I, I found 10 scriptural reasons why every believer should be very, very cautious about alcohol consumption. Notice what I said. I said I found 10 scriptures, 10 reasons why every believer should be very cautious about alcohol consumption. That's the way the Lord gave it to me to say it because I know a lot of people that, you know, they, they do drink. But there needs to be a caution sign lifted up right now because some things are going way too far. And um, there's just some things. I just think, I, I pray that, you know, the Lord just would minister to the hearts of people. You've got to be cautious sometimes about pulling out weeds because you pull up the tares with it, you know. And some things you just need to let grow to the end. And then it'll be all be separated at the end, Jesus said. But let's stand up before I preach another sermon. How's that? <laughs> And there is something I want to pray tonight before we go. And we're going to pray the two Ephesian prayers for people in the church right here. This is our, our first responsibility. And so I would like you to join with me in, in these two prayers. It'll take about three minutes total. And just agree with me as we say these words that this is not just happening for people that are here tonight, but this is happening to all of our church family who are here, who are coming physically to services on a weekly basis, people maybe who aren't coming physically anymore to services because they're still under our prayers. They'll be under my prayers until I see Jesus face to face, whether they ever come back physically or not. If they ever come to this church and I know they're a part of this church and they for some reason leave, they can't get away from my prayers. Um, and even future people that the Lord sees will be here, these prayers cover them too. And I sense the Lord was was saying if we'll pray these Ephesian prayers for our brothers and sisters on a regular basis, our church will double just from people coming back who used to come, let alone new people. And I say that just because, you know, God wants his house full. It means there's people looking to him and taking the things of God serious. So, Father, as we pray these prayers tonight, we pray them for ourselves, for every brother and sister in this church family, past, present, or future. And so I'm going to pray it, but if you guys just want to agree with me while you hear these words and maybe pray in the Spirit quietly while you hear these words, just agree with me because I'm going to pray these two prayers right out of the Bible. Heavenly Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would give unto every man, woman, and child, brother, sister, sheep, and lamb that's a part of this church, past, present, or future. Give them, Lord, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. The eyes of their understanding being enlightened. Father, that they may know what is the hope of your calling, what the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints, what is the exceeding greatness of your power to usward who believe, 
according to the working of your mighty power, which you worked in Christ when you raised him from the dead, set him at your own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power, might and dominion and every name that's been named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And Father, we're asking that you would grant unto every man, woman, and child, brother, sister, sheep, and lamb of this church, past, present, and future, grant them according to the riches of your glory to be strengthened with might by your spirit in their inner man, that Christ may dwell in their hearts by faith, that they being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, that they would know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that they might be filled with all the fullness of God. And now, Father, unto you that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us, unto you be glory in the church, by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. And now, Father, we come into agreement that we would all stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Thank you. Just pray, pray in the Spirit just for a minute. Ico domonde e framantanci chiate viandano monde brapacaisto. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters, even beyond what our intellect knows. Ucoro dofonde, you know what they're going through. You know what's holding them. You know what's hurting them. Ikra viante, we pray for a clean break and a freedom to come into the things of God on a higher level. Bonde ista viante branani. Nicho, Kufro, Mondonye, Eto, Bricata, Edro, Mosonda, Ele Javinta, Crevo, Monde, Branda, Ista, Coonte, Giante, Branda, Fiana, Udolomo, Brocosa, Viata, Grefa, Giento, Bromononote. Father, we're asking that the fire of God would be stirred up in every brother, every sister. Help us, Father God, to kuno oche, vindi i grianto. We declare you are our helper. Idolo fronoshta. Lord, help lies to be exposed. Reveal things that have looked good but aren't good. Open eyes. Bring revelation, Father, that sets free. We pray in Jesus' name. And we thank you for it, Lord. It's happening, and we praise you for it. And we glorify you for all the wonderful results. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I believe we did the Lord's work tonight. Thanks, guys, for being with us. We'll see you next Wednesday, hopefully on Sunday as well.